Welcome to Beyond the Headlines, I'm Cheryl Jennings. Today we have a special roundtable discussion in celebration of Black History Month. ABC 7's Eric Thomas is here with local leaders for an in-depth conversation about opportunities and challenges in the African American community. Thanks, Cheryl. In the studio with me right now are Karen Clopton, Chief Administrative Law Judge with the California Public Utilities Commission, Eric McDonald, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer with United Way of the Bay Area, and Regina Jackson, President and CEO of the East Oakland Youth Development Center. First up, thanks to all of you for joining us, and we'll be talking to them in just a second. But before we begin, one of the issues at the top of all our minds is access to higher education. The cost of a college education has been soaring for years now, and in January, the president stepped forward with a plan to put the brakes on rising fees and to reform how students get financial aid. ABC 7's Wayne Friedman filed this report on January 27th with reaction from UC Berkeley, where fees have gone up 2,000% since the 70s. As parents tell their kids, this is the best time of their lives, the college years, a time without worries, except for the problem of paying. How much in debt are you? Um, I'd rather not say. Which explains President Obama's popularity today when he came to the very public University of Michigan and found a receptive audience. We are putting colleges on notice. You can't keep... You can't assume that you'll just jack up tuition every single year. If you can't stop tuition from going up, then the funding you get from taxpayers each year will go down. We should push colleges to do better. We should hold them accountable if they don't. It is campaigning. It's not governing, no. San Francisco State political science professor Robert C. Smith knows a thing or two about tuition inflation. The Ph.D. he earned from California colleges and universities cost $7,000 some 40 years ago. The president spoke to one of his big constituents, college students, and he made an appeal to them on the basis of trying to gather their support for the fall election. <laughs> Rising fees have certainly become a potent issue at UC Berkeley where price increases and program cuts have followed in line with the state's budget woes. It's ten times what it was when my mom went to school, which sounds ridiculous, but it's, it's ridiculous. Especially in California, the issue is not even pulling federal money as a threat. The issue is the fact that our budget as a California is just so screwed up to begin with. Specifics of the president's plan remain vague. He wants a billion dollars to spread among states that reform their educational systems. For present college students who must already begin their working lives in debt, those reforms would come too late. For Frank Luna, way too late. I'm supposed to be finished next semester, um, but I'd like to, uh, I, I'd hope to get into the honors program, which would actually extend me one more semester, and, and I'd have to take out another loan, but uh, uh, it will probably help me get into grad school, and if that's my goal, then I guess I'm going to have to take out, an, unhappily take out another loan. Well, we're going to begin, since education is very important to all of our panelists, with Karen Clopton, who's, as we said, Chief Administrative Law Judge with the CPUC. So if we start with the premise that getting an edu higher education is more expensive and tougher for everybody, uh, then it must be really difficult for underserved minorities. Yes, it is. And I think that that's one of the reasons that we have to concentrate on K through 12 and getting our children prepared to go to college. Um, because if they don't go to college, then they're not going to be able to go to law school. And my particular interest uh, as a lawyer and a judge is that our children become lawyers and judges and prosecutors and public defenders because we are disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system. And if we don't educate our children, then we have a tremendous disparity that's only going to get worse. Fewer than 2% uh, of the lawyers in California are African American. Since we're talking about numbers, Karen, uh, the numbers of, of African American males in the criminal justice system are very stark. Why don't you share those with us? Yes, well over 50 percent of uh, the prison population in California uh, cons is, consists of minorities 
And so when we're looking at the Hispanic as well as the African American population, it's completely disproportionate to uh, our population in the general population. The census data in 2010 uh, reveals that about 6%, 7% of Californians are African American, mm -hmm. while over 50% of the prison population and the criminal justice system are African American. Eric, I, I want to get you in on this too, because sure. this all starts with the cycle of poverty and, and sort of dovetails into the educational problem. Absolutely. I mean, the, the debilitating impact of poverty kind of shows itself across education, health access, economic and financial mobility, etc. And so the reality that, you know, in our history, when there was a point when high school education was sufficient. Mm -hmm. You could get a good job and care for your family. And today what's required is, at, at a minimum, an undergraduate degree, if not a postgraduate degree. Uh, and so the, uh, the need that we have to focus on K through 12 education and at the same time ensure that there are there is adequate access to higher education for in particular low-income families because that really becomes the gateway out of poverty is really critical. Mm -hmm. Regina, uh, Regina Jackson, uh, how how prepared are the young people you see for higher education? Well, we are preparing them. That's our responsibility. Um, exposure and opportunity go hand in hand. We're showing eight-year-olds that college should be a part of their future. We have youth-led college mentoring programs so that the college students are sharing with the high school students not just academically how they need to be prepared but cerebrally for different communities. A lot of our kids go to school in California but a lot go out of state and what are the cultures there? What are the other kinds of ways that you're going to have to line up? And so they have to um, make a footprint for themselves so that the expectation is that they're not alone, that they mm -hmm. have support. So we, we started with where the money's going to come from for all this. <laughs> so very briefly and we're going to explore this later, but Karen, uh, how do we do that? Well, I, I have to admit what I always tell young people is don't worry about the money for college because we will find a way, um, especially with the private colleges. The private colleges have stood up, mm -hmm. whereas the public institutions have uh, really fallen down on the job. And in California with Proposition 209, yeah. we have that obstacle. But Karen, I have to interrupt you here for a second. We will come back and discuss this in a minute, but we need to take a break right now. We'll continue our discussion in just a couple of minutes. Don't go. Welcome back. I'm Eric Thomas here for Cheryl Jennings. We've been talking with local community leaders about topics affecting our African American community. Religious leaders and youth groups in Richmond last year started a program designed to help keep kids in school and away from crime by establishing relationships with mentors. ABC 7's Vic Lee filed this story last January. Almost a quarter of students in the West Contra Costa Unified School District drop out. However, with the help of a mentoring program, 98% of youth matched with mentors stay in school and do not drop out. This was the vision at the Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church to recruit mentors for youngsters in Richmond. It's part of a larger program to stem the cycle of violence in the city. Tonight's kickoff by church leaders, adults, and youth groups was meant to coincide with events around Martin Luther King Day. Eight-year-old Jason Hill memorized the civil rights leader's inspirational speech. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. There were testimonials from mentors and those who benefited. But the biggest part that we can have and we can share with the youth is to genuinely, genuinely give them our heart. Well, having that mentor will show us how to be better young ladies and better in school and having somebody to come to to talk to. Because that's what my mentors did. They always let me know I could depend on them. We honor the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when we connect vision-filled young people with dream-filled adults. Plenty of dream-filled mentors stood up to volunteer. Then they filled out commitment cards. Vic Lee, ABC 7 News. Yeah, one yeah. way to get kids to want to focus on college is to show them what the results can be. We've all had experience with mentoring up here. Um, I guess from, from the other side of mentoring, why is it important? Why do you do it? Well, I think that uh, servant leadership 
is that we're responsible for our community. And if we don't plant the seeds to help them grow, who's going to help take care of us? Mm -hmm. um, it's the right thing to do. It's the timely thing to do. And they can't get there by themselves. They have to have someone that supports them, that loves them, that nurtures them, and that challenges them. Mm -hmm. I still have mentors to this day. And I tell them about that because I didn't get where I got by myself. Eric, how do you get through to kids as a mentor? Well, I think part of it is sharing your own story. Um, you know, certainly while we all celebrate and should rightly so celebrate our successes and share those, I think sometimes we also need to share some of the challenges we faced mm -hmm. and how we kind of navigated those challenges. And um, I think my experience and uh, of others has been once young people understand you can relate, you understand, um, you know what it's like to have, be at that fork in the road that says go and do the right thing or go and do perhaps the wrong thing, how that challenge internal, internal discussion, if you will, that dialogue that happens, um, is, is not an easy one, but that it can be overcome. Um, when kids understand that you understand and can relate, they often are willing to open up and, and be willing to be engaged. So, Karen, how often do you, when you mentor, have to play the card of, you know, my job is very important and there was a time in this country when you couldn't, black people couldn't have this job? Well, I'm, I'm the first African American to hold my position. And I wish I were saying that I, would, I was the 101st. But um, so I think that they are always surprised to find out, oh, you're the first one? I said, yes. And there are only this many in, in, judges who are African American. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there are, you know, basically when they go into the court system or into the criminal justice system, they see 75% white judges. And so we really are working uh, to change that. But it has to start, again, with the pipeline to get them into law school, to get them into college, to graduate them from high school, uh, to really have a love of learning and wanting to give back. Because that's all part of it, this I, obligation. I by the way, I want you to finish the thought we ended last segment, which, with, which was um, get to college first, we'll worry about the money later. Yes. I truly believe that the whole discussion about money and how much college costs and, oh, it doesn't, uh, it's not cost effective. I've seen a lot of analyses about this, uh, and I think that that's a smokescreen. I think that really what we need to do is focus on education and recommit in America to public education, education for all, mm. and that it's not about the money. It really isn't. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We need to take another break right now. We'll be back with more from our African American Roundtable. Stay with us. Welcome back to Beyond the Headlines. I'm Eric Thomas for this week's special Black History Month edition. Now, we're talking about challenges and opportunities in the African American community. A nonprofit group is guiding dozens of people hoping to become, to become the next wave of Oakland teachers. They're a diverse group, which, as ABC 7's Lillian Kim tells us, is the whole idea. You are going to have to teach all day, and you're going to take intern classes at night. These are aspiring and, um, teachers getting a crash course on what it's going to take to get a job in the Oakland Unified School District. Most are minorities who grew up in Oakland. I was once one of those kids that was misunderstood, and I have, you know, a clear understanding of what's going on out there, and I can help them. The nonprofit, federally funded group Teach Tomorrow in Oakland thinks so too, which is why they recruited this diverse pool of applicants. They're hoping minority teachers can help turn around the district's dropout rate, which is now around 40 percent. Most of the dropouts are minority boys. And so we need to have young men who can see young African American men who are teaching, who are leading schools in front of them, who are right there engaging them using the types of strategies that they need to keep them in class. According to information collected from the state, 92% of the students at Oakland Unified are minorities, but when it comes to the teaching staff, less than half are people of color. Cheryl Moore, a former city worker, says she was so tired of hearing those numbers that she decided to come out of retirement to earn her teaching credential. She says she'll be able to talk to black students in a way others may not. I might look like a mama figure to them and, and could say it in a way that sit yourself 
you know, <laughs> down, whereas a white teacher and a minority may not say it that way. For people with a BA, it's going to take up to a year and a half to get their credential. Teach Tomorrow in Oakland will be helping them every step of the way. The group is counting on these applicants to change the look of Oakland schools. In Oakland, Lillian Kim, ABC 7 News. So at the bottom line, that story is about giving back people who want to stay in their community and teach, which is something we could use a lot more in the professional ranks in our community. Eric? Well, I think one of the challenges is there's great need, right? And we need professionals across all fronts. We need professional teachers, judges, we need them leading nonprofits, being in physicians, etc. cetera. Um, but often, particularly in the public sector or public service space, whether it's a nonprofit or teachers or community policing, the, candidly, the compensation in that space um, is challenging. Uh, and so you really are asking folks to make a personal sacrifice and commitment, which many do, and, and our, 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 our communities rather are really well served as a result, but we need more. Hmm? How, how important do you think that is to young people? Um, I think it's exceptionally important. It's, it's critical that you put people that um, are committed to community and committed to saving our humanity in front of them every day so that they understand that it's also part of their responsibility. And I prefer to look at it as an investment. When you give back to community, the rewards are so much greater for mm -hmm. yourself. You know, we teach young people to follow their passion, find something they like, and go after that. They will never, ever be poor a day in their lives. Mm -hmm. Passion. That's very important. So you have an obvious passion for the law. How do you in instill that in other people? Well, I do have young people ask me, well, what should I major in if I, I want to be a lawyer? I said, well, do you like to read? Because the, the more you read, the better you will write. And being a lawyer is about reading and writing. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we're losing books, unfortunately. And I'm really encouraging of, of young people to read and use their imaginations uh, so that they can become our future scientists and engineers and teachers and police officers as well as judges and lawyers and, and, uh, and get involved in running our country. Democracy mm -hmm. is not a spectator sport. <laughs> exactly. You mean there are other places to get? text than a computer screen? Is that what you're talking about? There it is. <laughs> Imagine and that. it doesn't have an on and off switch. There you are. Um, yeah, computer gaming, that's something, well, we'll get into that mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but, Eric, I'd like to follow up on a point, and we can only get into it right now just briefly, but uh, you have issues with the way we structure schools. The best teachers teach the, the highest rated kids as opposed to putting them with the kids who could really use that help. Well, you know, the, the unfortunate reality is we have, in particular African American, but certainly students of color, lead in all of the wrong categories. Highest dropouts, lowest achievement rates, etc. And part of that is driven by the resource that's put in front of them. The okay, newest teachers. Right my my sure, apologies. But absolutely. We'll, we have one more segment we can get to, to that in, but we need to take another break right now. We'll be right back to continue our conversation. Welcome back. I'm Eric Thomas for this Black History Month edition of Beyond the Headlines in for Gerald Jennings. Um, we were talking about giving back, and we, we've been talking about education as the thread that runs through all of this. We have not talked about the responsibility on parents to make sure that their kids get that education. Let's we'll start down at the end, Karen, and work our way back here. Uh, could you talk about that for a second? Well, I had a young man say to me, a young, a young father who has four children, uh, we were talking about putting money away for college. Uh, I think we were talking about a 529 plan and how that worked. And he looked at me in all earnestness and said, what if they're not college material? And I said, you know what? All children are college material. Whether or not they go to Harvard is a different issue. All children should go to college. And you have to start talking to them when they're little about the future and going to college. And you need to be prepared for that. And whether you, you're putting away $10 a month for each child or as much as you can, it adds up. 
it's all good. Mm -hmm. And it shows that you're serious and committed. Because education is the one thing that no one can take away from you. Eric, that sounds like expectations to me. And, you know, now that we have an African-American president, maybe those expectations can be even raised a little bit higher. I think they have to continue to be raised higher. That said, you know, I think we do cannot ignore, the, again, the debilitating impact of poverty. Very often, families living in poverty have been in that space for generations. And so this expectation that these parents who mean well for their kids and tend for the best for the kids, that they're going to pass on good study habits that they themselves didn't have, that they're going to pass on good financial planning and that they themselves didn't have, is probably not as realistic um, as we think it ought to be. And so we have to support parents. I agree with you. Parents are a key uh, player in, uh, you know, in the lives of their children. But we have to remember that many of them living in those kind of, again, very difficult circumstances of poverty need support themselves to, in fact, be better parents. Regina? We try to empower the parents while we're empowering the kids and mm -hmm. actually sometimes having the young people teach the lessons at home, whether it's about cooking, finances, or wanting to go to college. We have had parents drop into GED programs with their children. We embrace that. And then we send those kids, 75% of them, to college. Now, we create pipelines for, you know, fire and plumbing. I mean, not everybody wants to go to college. More education is exceptionally important. But there are a lot of careers that you can do a little bit more, maybe not the BA, and still have a wonderful career. I'm going to need a plumber. I just can't do it. Yeah, there are schools. <laughs> That's correct. And that, colleges that and universities. Go directly that, toward yeah. that. More education means more success for you. These are tight times, though. We, public spending is, is way down. So we got about 15 seconds apiece to address what that means to us and where we go from there. Starting on the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think our resources should go to uh, real need. And that includes education, health care, as well as public safety. Mm -hmm. It has to go to infrastructure. And as far as I'm concerned, education is your basic infrastructure. Eric, quickly. Yes, and I think we also need to focus resources on supporting families and building financial plans for themselves so they can climb out of their circumstances of poverty. Quickly. Character development, exposure, education, and support systems. Everybody needs someone they can go to for help. I thank all of you for being here. It was really fun talking to you. Really thank special you. Thank you for having us. Topics. And we're out of time. Thanks to Regina, Eric, and Karen for being part of our African American Roundtable discussion and for sharing your thoughtful insights with us. Have a great day. Thank you, Eric, and our guest on today's special edition of Beyond the Headlines. Information about everything we discussed today is available on our website at abc7news.com slash community. You can find us on Facebook at ABC7 Community Affairs and follow me on Twitter at Cheryl ABC7. I'm Cheryl Jennings. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great week. Bye-bye.